Hello, and welcome to the Europa Games. This series is heavily inspired by Tales of the Hunger Games by Christian Blanco, a series that does dramatic retellings of every edition of the Hunger Games. It's linked in the description, and I would highly recommend watching if you haven't already. As expected, content warning for graphic descriptions of violence. Be prepared. The first Europa Games had 28 tributes, one for each member state, and one from an associate member state, Iceland. The games lasted 23 hours and 14 minutes, and were won by Kiastutis Kiastus Ostrowskis, age 15, from Lithuania. Tributes were chosen for the game by randomly drawing from each state's population of 13 to 18 year olds. All residents in this age bracket, and their families, were required to gather in their town or city centre in anticipation of the reaped contestant. As nothing of this scale had ever been attempted before, there inevitably ended up being a couple of incidents when drawing and retrieving the tributes. Suzanne, from Malta, was not present in her town centre when her name was drawn, but was found and seized in her family home nearby, where she was still fast asleep. Upon the calling of his name, Harry, from Ireland, who was one of the top marathon runners in his age category, sprinted away and ran for three kilometres before being tracked down by the Guardi. Each tribute was transported to the European state's capital, Brussels, either by train or private jet, and brought to a refurbished youth hostel. The sleeping quarters for the tributes were made up of four rooms, two for boys and two for girls, with seven contestants to each room. Emotions ran high that night, with many tributes breaking down over the prospect of dying a painful death. Others, however, remained calm, and began to interact with one another. Many of the now staple alliances of the Europa Games had their origins in this game, such as Greece and Cyprus, the Nordics, and the ex-Yugoslavs. Upon arriving, Kiastus was quiet at first and kept to himself, but struck up a friendship with his bunkmate, Arvids, from Latvia. Arvids was a rather pudgy 14-year-old boy, who was nervous but also somewhat excited about the games, reasoning that this made all his other everyday fears seem a lot less scary and he said that if he survived the games, he would jump from the highest diving board at the pool and ask out the girl that he liked. The first Europa games were preceded by one day of training, where the tributes were instructed in how to use a variety of weapons. Castus and Arvids attended each station together, and soon became accustomed to a number of different techniques. Arvids noticed the alliances that were popping up on geographic and political lines, and suggested teaming up with the Estonian tribute which Castus agreed with. They found the Estonian contestant, Vivi, practicing at the spear-throwing station. She was a perky 17-year-old who was quite tall and thin. At first, she was unsure about allying with two younger boys who did not appear to be physically fit, but was convinced after seeing their skills at sword fighting. The Baltic Alliance would, of course, go on to become the most feared and formidable alliance in the Europa Games, though this reputation would gradually build up as future editions came and went. When it came to non-geographic alignments, Serena, from Italy, caused controversy by starting an alliance that only allowed other female tributes, insisting that the men in the game were not to be trusted. In retaliation, Philippe, from Slovakia, started an equality alliance, welcoming in both boys and girls. The next day, the tributes were loaded onto a bus and brought to another building, which turned out to be the Battle Arena. Each contestant was blindfolded as they were brought in, and told over the loudspeaker that when the countdown was finished, they would all take off their blindfolds and be able to move away from their pedestals. They were informed that the construction in front of them would be the only place in the arena to find weapons and supplies. Once the countdown concluded, everyone took off their blindfolds and gazed at what was in front of them. A large, wooden playground structure complete with steps, slides, and rope ladders. The first tribute to die was Rodana from Czechia who was strangled to death by Serena. Rodana was one of the female tributes who joined the Equality Alliance, and Serena screamed at her for being a traitor as she killed her. The first few minutes of the game turned out to be extremely deadly, with almost a third of the tributes being killed in a short space of time. Three out of four of the Nordic competitors died during the so-called bloodbath. Castus grabbed a spear from the lower level of the structure, while Vivi grabbed a backpack, and both ran away into a much larger playground structure that surrounded the one full of supplies. Vivi realised that her backpack contained a first aid kit, but emptied all the supplies into the backpack and threw away the plastic box, figuring it would be too heavy to lug around. 
Arvids decided to venture a little further into the heart of the arena, figuring would have better supplies. He got into a fight with Rudolf from Hungary over a bow and arrow on one of the platforms. Arvids won and used one of the arrows to stab Rudolf in the chest, killing him instantly. Vivi, Arvids, and Castus reconvened in one of the tunnels and discussed a battle plan. Arvid said that while he was in the heart, he saw that the Equality and Girls' Alliances were at each other's throats, so they just had to stay under the radar for a while and they'd be fine. However, his hunch was immediately disproven when several members of the Girls' Alliance realised that they were in the tunnel. The three of them immediately fled, but saw that the girls were coming at them from all directions. Castus suggested climbing across a rope ladder to another part of the structure that was seemingly empty, and the other two agreed. However, Arvid soon became out of breath and realised that the girls were catching up to him. As Vivi and Castus got away, Arvis tried his hand with shooting arrows at the girls. He caused several injuries and successfully killed Ingrid from the Netherlands and Myrto from Cyprus, but the remaining girls pushed him to the ground and threw him off the side of the structure. Arvids wasn't killed but was in too much pain to get up. Serena slid down the pole and used a knife to slit his throat. As Castus and Vivi got far away from the commotion, Castus became worried that Arvids hadn't caught up to them and wanted to go looking for him, but Vivi convinced him not to saying it was too risky to get spotted by the other tributes again. They were also horrified to find the dead body of the Croatian tribute at the bottom of one of the slides. They found a small compartment in the structure with a secret opening and climbed inside. They stayed there as the day turned to night, and the loudspeaker announced the names and nationalities of the fallen tributes. Vivi and Castus were saddened to find out that Arvids had been killed earlier that day. Castus blamed himself for the death of his Latvian ally, saying he should have gone back for him. But Vivi convinced him that the girls' lines had surrounded Arvids and they would have put themselves in danger. Castus remembered how Arvid spoke about wanting to face his fears when he got out of the arena, and with a deep breath he dropped two truth bombs on Vivi and the viewing audience, revealing that he's gay and his family had been physically abusing him for years. Vivi was shocked and gave Castus a hug, telling him that his parents shouldn't make him feel ashamed of his identity. Castus clarified that his parents did not know that he was gay, but sheepishly guessed that they did now. The Equality Alliance was overall in a good position. During the bloodbath, their members gathered some backpacks full of supplies. They stationed themselves up high on a platform in the player on structure and had enough food and water to last themselves another day. Feely proved himself to be an excellent leader, making every member feel welcome, and acted like they were just a group of bros hanging out. He made everyone feel calm and forget about the horrors of the game. But things took a turn when the sun set, and Philippe's breathing started to get shaky. He revealed to the rest of the group that he was petrified of the dark. The other boys teased him about it at first, but when Philippe started to go into full panic attack mode, they tried to calm him down by singing songs. Their efforts did not work, however, and Philippe suddenly jumped from the platform headfirst and landed on the concrete ground below, smashing his skull and resulting in his death. The girls' alliance was not doing so well. They set up camp on the other side of the structure and did not have much food on them. So Serena suggested they go back to the heart to see if there were any supplies left. The girls set off, not knowing that the heart was already occupied by someone else, Bray, the Icelandic tribute. After the rest of his allies were killed, Bray wandered around the arena, staying undetected, then decided to go back to the heart and hoard the remaining supplies. When the girls arrived at the heart, they decided to split into pairs and gather all the supplies together. Bray realised he was no longer alone, and hid by hanging onto monkey bars that were underneath one of the wooden platforms. However, he was spotted by Liliana from Slovenia and Petja from Bulgaria. Liliana initially thought it might be another tribute's hanging corpse, but Petja realised it was a living contestant. Bray suddenly dropped from the monkey bars, landed on the platform, and used a bow and arrow to stab Liliana in the neck, resulting in her death. He also tried to hit Petja, but she ran down the steps screaming. This alerted Serena and Anetta from Poland, who went up a rope ladder to see what was going on. Petia and Bray were having some sort of slap fight. Petia had already knocked Bray's bow out of his hand and was trying to get at him with her hatchet, but he managed to push her away, only to run straight into Serena and Anetta. Petia and Anetta both grabbed Bray while Serena slit his throat, then they chucked his body off the platform. As they took a moment to catch their breath, Serena used her knife to stab Anetta in the chest making her fall onto the platform. Before Petia realised what was going on, Serena also stabbed her several times in the chest, resulting in her death. She then finished off Anetta, who was trying to crawl away. It is assumed that Serena did this because she was worried about having to face off against so many allies towards the end, 
She then descended back down the rope ladder to her two remaining allies, Carmina from Spain and Eurida from Greece, and sorrowfully told them about how Bray had committed a massacre, but she managed to kill him at the last minute. Carmina gave Serena a hug and consolation, and the three of them slept in sleeping bags at the top of the hearth. By the morning, there were nine tributes remaining. As the sun rose, Castus and Vivi awoke in their hiding place and were both starving. Castus jokingly said he was so hungry that he would eat the body at the bottom of the slide, and Vivi said they may not have a choice since they'd need energy to face off against the other tributes if they were found. Castus was horrified by the idea, but ultimately went along with it. They found that the Croatian girl's body was still at the bottom of the slide, and used the spear to tear into her flesh. This sight horrified viewers and was later removed from future releases. The three girls awoke, still shaken up over what had happened the night before. Carrying some of the supplies they gathered, they ventured through the outer structure to hunt for other tributes, and found the Equality Alliance sleeping in one of the higher platforms, which was now down to four members. The girls' alliance climbed up to the platform, Carmina took off her shoes and quietly stepped across the sleeping boys. She got down on her knees and held her knife over the Austrian tribute. Then she put his hand over his mouth and she slit his throat. The boy woke up as she was doing this and let out a muffled scream, which alerted the other three boys. Just as the Austrian boy died, the three of them dogpiled Carmina and pinned her to the ground, then proceeded to stab her multiple times. The other two girls, Irida and Serena, who were hanging from the rope ladder below, decided to retreat while the boys had their backs turned. They reached the concrete ground, and Irida watched as Serena took some matches out of her backpack and used them to set the playground structure on fire. After killing Carmina, the three boys huddled together to come up with a plan moving forward. Hauke from Germany, Maxime from Belgium, and Sorin from Romania had all clicked from the beginning due to their shared love of music, and came up with the idea of splitting up and using ambush tactics to defeat the other remaining tributes. Serena used the matches to set fires throughout the outer structure, though the Equality Alliance noticed what was going on and moved to the lower ground to continue their planned attack. Castus and Vivi noticed their hiding place suddenly shift to one side and could smell burning. Castus poked his head out of the secret entrance to see what was going on and realized the structure around them was on fire. He screamed at Vivi to get out and leapt to another platform that was slowly collapsing. As Castus climbed down to the concrete ground, Vivi tried to get out of the secret compartment, but ended up collapsing with it. Vivi was not killed by the initial impact, but she soon suffocated from being surrounded by fire and covered in burning wood and metal. As the outer structure burned down around him, Castus ran to the heart to find somewhere to hide. Meanwhile, Sorin and Hauke came at Irida and Serena from different directions. Serena tried to throw knives at Hauke, but he managed to dodge them. They both got into a brawl, and Serena put up a good fight, but was ultimately disadvantaged by her lack of a weapon, and Hauke struck her in the head with his hatchet. Meanwhile, Irida and Sorin had also got into a fight and stabbed each other several times with their weapons, with Irida delivering a fatal wound to Sorin's stomach. Right at that moment, Hauke, who had just finished off Serena, grabbed Irida and tackled her to the ground, killing her too. Maxime noticed Castus hiding in the heart and ran towards it, yelling at Hauke to back him up. Despite knowing he was being approached, Castus stayed where he was. Maxime and Hauke climbed up from either side, and both landed on the same long platform that Castus was on. Castus stood up with a panicked look on his face as he was pursued from either side, and Hauke threw a knife at him. But Castus managed to dodge it by jumping from the platform and grabbing onto some monkey bars that were at least a metre away. Castus later said that he had become skilled at climbing from using the roof of his house as refuge from his family. The knife instead hit Maxime in the face, and he collapsed to the ground. Hauke stood in shock over what he had just done, but in that time, Castus leaped back onto the platform and stabbed Hauke in the back with his spear. Maxime, clearly disoriented and suffering from brain damage, tried to grab Castus, but ended up falling off the platform and onto the concrete ground, resulting in his death. Castus was in tears as he stabbed Hauke several more times, telling him he did his best. The loudspeaker announced that Castus was the winner of the first Europa Games, and he was told to stay where he was while some firefighters rushed in to put out the fire surrounding the hearth. Once that was sorted out, Castus left through a secret door that had just opened on the far end of the arena. As soon as he was back in the outside world, he fell to the ground and sobbed uncontrollably as he spread out his limbs. Shortly after his victory, Castus' family was investigated for physically abusing him, and he was put in a foster family in a different town. At his new school, he was mercilessly bullied for his sexuality and his actions in the games, but he took up diving and became involved in an LGBT youth club where he got the courage to ask out another boy that he had a crush on. Each year, Castus was brought back to the games to mentor the future Lithuanian tributes, and when he was 18, he and his boyfriend moved to Brussels permanently.
The second Europa Games lasted three days and were won by Lazarus Papadimitriou, age 16, from Cyprus. It had 29 participants. Iceland was swapped out for another associate European state, Liechtenstein, and the Games also saw the debut of Scotland. Scotland was the northern region of the rebellious state of Britain and stayed loyal to the rest of the Union when fighting broke out. Negotiations on Scotland's membership into the European states were completed a month after the first Europa Games, and they were set to join the following year. Many changes were made to the Games between the first and second edition. Following the controversial scene where Chiastus and Vivi ate another contestant, it was decided that dead bodies would be removed by armoured staff members during the Games. The second Europa Games also saw the introduction of the semi-final, where tributes would battle it out for 10 spots in the grand final. It was decided that France, Germany, Italy and Spain would automatically qualify to the grand final each year, as these regions were the largest financial contributors to the European states. The 10 remaining countries that ranked the highest the previous year would also be automatically qualified. For the second edition, these were Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Estonia, Greece, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, and the defending champions, Lithuania. There were talks about hosting the second Europa Games in Lithuania, but the executives behind the Games decided that it would be impractical to set up a new training centre and arena in a different country each year, and declared that all editions of the Europa Games would take place in Brussels. The 15 semi-finalists were reaped in the morning, while the 14 automatic qualifiers were set to be reaped later in the evening. Security was tightened this year to prevent another escape attempt, and stricter penalties were enforced on those who did not attend the reaping. Lazarus' family lived very far away from the nearest town, but had no problem leaving early, as they were used to getting up at dawn to attend their dairy and honey farm. When Lazarus's name was reaped, he nervously made his way to the stage, and said he would try his best, and whatever happened was God's plan. This answer drew applause not just from that town, but also from the rest of the Cypriots who watched him live. The tribute drawn for Czechia was Mackenzie Gartner, who was from an American expat family who had moved to Prague just three months prior and did not speak any Czech. Her father tried to insist that this was a mistake, but the mayor of Prague insisted that any 13 to 18 year old who was registered as a resident of the state could be drawn to participate. The semi-finalists were all transported to Brussels and told to wait in a room full of chairs until all of them had arrived. Lazarus was one of the last to arrive, and when he entered the room, he asked if the Greek tribute had arrived yet. He was informed by the Dutch tribute, Jacintha, that Greece was automatically qualified to the final, but she was interested in Greek philosophy, so she could substitute until then. It was of note that out of the 15 Reap semi-finalists, only three were boys, and the rest were girls. Once all the contestants had arrived, the returning head trainer, Frederic Ardiccioni, entered the room and quickly refreshed them on how the Europa Games worked. He then told them they would be entering the arena right now, which was met with many gasps. The tributes were blindfolded and brought into a room onto exercise mats. They were told that the semi-final would end when five of them were killed. If anyone killed another contestant after that, they would be given a one-minute handicap in the grand final. An air horn sounded and the tributes took off their blindfolds to find they were inside what appeared to be a school gym, with the only source of light being a large overhead window. The mats were arranged in a circle around a wide range of weapons. Lazarus grabbed the first weapon he could find, which was a spear, and retreated to one of the walls. He waved the weapon around in case anyone came near him, but nobody did. Most of the tributes took a defensive stance. The only alliance from the previous year with a significant number of tributes was the Nordic Alliance, who all stood back to back wielding their weapons. Justina from Lafia killed three tributes during the semi-final, while Mackenzie and Jacintha killed one each. The semi-final lasted four minutes and 31 seconds. When it was over, the remaining tributes were ordered to drop their weapons, and it was announced that Croatia, Ireland, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg and Scotland had been eliminated from the games. The remaining countries, Cyprus, Czechia, Denmark, Finland, Hungary, Latvia, Malta, Netherlands, Portugal and Sweden were all safe to advance to the grand final. Justina, who had just minutes ago appeared to be a bloodthirsty monster, had pulled multiple other tributes into a hug and was squealing with joy. The ten qualifiers got on a coach to where they were staying, and in the meantime, the 14 automatically qualified tributes had all been reaped. 
There was controversy when Anu, from Estonia, and Elo, from France, both appeared visibly hungover when they got on stage. Both were 16 years old and found to have alcohol in their system when breathalyzed. The accommodation for the second Europa Games saw an upgrade compared to the previous year, with two tributes sharing each room. They were assigned based on gender, then in alphabetical order of country name. Lazarus shared a room with Elwa, and he expressed distress over seeing five other people getting killed before his eyes, most of whom were younger girls. Elwa laughed and told Lazarus that he'd get nowhere in the games with that mindset, and talked about how he'd watched hours of the games when it was on last year, and found it to be quite entertaining. It's fair to say Lazarus did not sleep well that night. The next day, the tributes began their training. The centre had been expanded this year to include stations for endurance and survival. Lazarus was still on the search for the Greek tribute when he saw a young girl crying behind some of the equipment. He asked her what was wrong, and she mumbled about how she did not want to die. Lazarus assured her that everyone had a chance to win and asked for her name, which she told him was Constantina. Lazarus realised that he had found the Greek tribute and brought her along to train at the plant station. It should be noted that tributes were required to speak English to each other because at the time it would have been tedious for the commentators of each broadcaster. Inspired by the previous edition's alliances, many other tributes tried banding together based on their country's affiliations. Germany and Austria, Netherlands and Belgium, Spain and Portugal, etc. to varying degrees of success. However, existing alliances started to form cracks. While they had worked together in the semi-final, Celia, from Finland, did not think that the Danish and Swedish tributes were taking the game seriously, seeming more focused on making the most of their final days. Celia instead tried to join the Baltic alliance, but they turned her down, not wanting a small and seemingly weak 13-year-old girl in their ranks. The Baltic alliance of that year was notable for being arrogant about their chances of winning. Anu was a skilled horse rider, Justina was an experienced hunter and fisherwoman, and Laimute from Lithuania was a climber, much like her predecessor. At one point, Justina used a derogatory term to describe Castus, stating, If a can win, so can we. After a day of training, the 24 tributes were brought to the arena, once again being blindfolded as they were guided to their podiums. Before the countdown started, the tributes were informed that armoured staff would enter the arena to dispose of dead bodies, and anyone who tried to interfere with them would get shot on sight. They were also told that, once again, all weapons and supplies they needed would be found in the heart of the arena. Once the countdown was over, the tributes took off their blindfolds and found themselves in flat lands surrounded by tall trees. These obstructed the view for tributes, who never knew how close they were to supplies or potential killers. After taking off his blindfold, Lazarus rushed into the forest, momentarily ducking behind trees in case he had an encounter. He grabbed the first backpack and weapon that he saw, a mace, then retreated. He realised that the heart was surrounded by a river, and with no other way across in sight, Lazarus chose to jump in. The current in the river was not that strong, but it was deep enough that his feet didn't touch the bottom. Despite the backpack hindering him, he managed to swim to the other side. Almost half the tributes died in the bloodbath that year, most at the hands of the Baltic Alliance. It was of note that all but one of the deaths were automatic qualifiers. The outer portion of the arena was also heavily forested, but had some open areas. Lazarus saw a cottage nearby, but chose to keep running around the river. He had a brief encounter with Martin from Malta, who ran off in the opposite direction as soon as he saw him. Martin was under the impression that Lazarus would kill him if he caught up and climbed one of the bushes, but Lazarus was not concerned with killing anyone, though he held out his mace in defence. During training, he and Constantina had agreed to meet each other by running towards the direction that the sun was in at the beginning of the games. Once Lazarus arrived in the right section of the arena, he explored through the bushes, hoping to find Constantina hiding somewhere, but to no avail. Constantina had in fact been killed in the bloodbath by Justina within minutes of the game's commencement. Lazarus decided to set up camp within the bushes and open the contents of the backpack to see what was inside, finding bandages, energy bars, and tinned food. Lazarus decided not to eat any of it for the moment and stood against one of the bushes with his mace, ready to defend himself against anyone who may have come by. By now, all the tributes except the Baltic Alliance had left the heart, leaving them to hoard the remaining supplies and weapons, and witnessed staff members taking away the dead bodies, to which they shouted jeers at their victims. Contrary to last year, all of the Nordic tributes managed to survive the bloodbath, but due to the arena being a lot larger than the first Europa Games, they had more trouble finding each other. This was not a concern to Celia, who assumed that her Nordic allies died in the bloodbath anyway. She had grabbed a backpack from the heart, but it only contained fishing equipment, which was useless to her as she didn't know how to use it. 
but at least she could eat the bait if she got really hungry. Celia was not worried about food, however, as she had found a blueberry bush near the river, giving her easy access to food and water. However, Celia did not have any weapons, and was worried about another tribute attacking her unexpectedly. She went to a denser part of the forest and climbed up one of the trees to hide, only to hear someone breathing loudly nearby. She jumped across trees to investigate, and saw Lazarus down below, still standing in the same place armed with his mace. Celia decided not to get his attention in case he tried to kill her, and moved to a tree that was a bit further away. Once the night fell, the loudspeakers announced the tributes who died that day. Lazarus was heartbroken to find out that Constantina had died, while Lila from Denmark and Lisa from Sweden were surprised to find out that Celia was still alive. They had both broken into one of the cottages by smashing a window and found that it was stocked with food and had proper beds and a working television, though it had no signal and could only play DVDs. Celia slept in a tree overnight and returned to Lazarus' spot to see if he was still there. Sure enough, he was fast asleep on the ground. Celia watched him for a few minutes and then jumped back across the bushes. However, she was alarmed when Lazarus suddenly yawned, indicating that he was awake. He said hello to Celia and she froze in shock. He told her that he wasn't going to hurt her, but she continued on her way. She went to the blueberry bush, but remained hidden after seeing that Andrea from Portugal had beaten her to it. She went back into the section of forest, only to bump into Lazarus again, who offered her an energy bar. Celia lied and said she already ate and she had to get going, but Lazarus continued to follow her, and asked how long she'd been watching him. She told him to be quiet because another tribute was nearby. Once they were deeper into the forest, Lazarus offered her the bar again, to which Celia laughed and said he was like her grandfather, not letting her leave until she was fed. Lazarus said he had no intention of leaving Celia alone, as he had already seen many other young girls die in this game. They went back through the forest, and Lazarus said his name, only for Celia to interject that she already knew it. Lazarus asked how, and she said he made quite a show during training when he was running around looking for the Greek tribute. Lazarus had a melancholy expression at the mention of Constantina, to which Celia apologised. Lazarus mentioned about how messed up the world had become, the children were being forced to kill each other on live TV, to which Celia shrugged and said this is a pretty badass way to die and most kids died from a lack of clean water. Lazarus and Celia spent the rest of the day together, sharing supplies and tips. At night time, the loudspeaker announced that there had only been one death that day. Mackenzie, from Czechia, had touched the electric fence that surrounded the arena, despite being warned that it would result in fatal electrocution before the countdown. The Baltic Alliance was annoyed that more tributes hadn't died because they had decided not to leave the heart that day, and anticipated that the other tributes would kill each other in the meantime. Laimute took the first watch shift that night. She climbed a tree and noticed some faint light in the distance. She woke up the other two over her findings and said there must be tributes inside one of the cottages, and the three decided to approach it. This was the cottage occupied by Lila and Lisa, and they had been watching a DVD when they heard the Baltic Alliance come in through the smash window. The girls screamed and ran to the bathroom, locking the door. Justina managed to ram at the door, while Anu and Laimute went back out through the window. The two Scandinavian girls panicked as they looked around the bathroom for things they could use as weapons, when Lila suddenly grabbed the shower curtain rod and yanked it out of its place. Justina managed to bust the door down, and despite holding a sword, she was apparently unprepared for the girls to have an actual defence plan, and was taken off guard when Lila struck her with the curtain rod multiple times, which made Justina fall to the ground with her head split open. The girls turned to the window for an escape, only for Anu to smash the window with her trident. The two girls got injured by the shards of glass, and Anu immediately stabbed Lila in the neck, killing her instantly. Lisa ran away and out the front door, but Anu and Laimute chased after her. Lisa was no match for them, and as Laimute stabbed her in the back with her spear, she burst into tears and cried about how she just wanted to go home. The Baltic girl stabbed her a few more times. She was dead, leaving nine tributes remaining. They ironically seemed more distraught over Lisa's death than Justina's, with Laimute making a jeering comment about how she couldn't in fact do anything Castus could. They discussed spending the night at the cottage, but Anu pointed out that the staff members collecting the bodies might attract attention, so they chose to return to the heart of the arena. In the morning, they trekked around the inside of the river, looking out for tributes who came to drink the water. They successfully killed Andrea using the strategy, but when they caught Armon from Belgium and Jacinth at the water, they only killed the latter and missed Armon, and he went running back into the forest. Anu and Laimute decided to swim across the river again and hunt down the rest of the tributes. Lazarus and Celia ate the rest of the energy bars that morning, and discussed what their plan was in the event that they encountered other tributes. Celia said there wasn't much she could do since she had no weapon, and Lazarus tried to come up with ways to kill people with a fishing rod, such as strangling them or stabbing their eye with a hook. 
Celia said smartly that if a fishing rod was so great, he'd be willing to swap, and Lazarus agreed. Celia then suggested exploring the cottage Lazarus had mentioned the day before. When they arrived, they tried the front door, but it was locked and went around the back, where they found one of the windows was smashed through. Celia said someone might already be occupying the house and they may have to kill them. Lazarus was not on board with this idea, with Celia replying that he may as well give up now if he's not willing to kill anyone. Before she could finish her sentence, two armoured staff members came out the door carrying the body of Martin from Malta, who had visible stab wounds on his neck and face. Celia pointed out that Martin had been murdered, and surely Lazarus wasn't above killing murderers. Lazarus ultimately agreed, and they entered the cottage to find the culprits. However, Anu and Lemute had already moved on to another part of the forest. They'd successfully killed the rest of the remaining tributes and debated how many were left. Anu said there were two tributes left, pointing out they hadn't killed Celia yet. Lemute suggested that the other two could have died in different ways, to which Anu told her to shut up and keep searching. After bursting into every room, Lazarus and Celia did not find any murderers in the cottage, but did take the opportunity to stock up on food and weapons. It should be noted that this was a different cottage to the one that Lila and Lisa had inhabited, which had already been ransacked by the Baltic Alliance. By this point, Lazarus had gotten very freaked out about being in the vicinity of murderers and wanted to go after them. But Celia pointed out that going back out in the open would make them too vulnerable and they needed to bring the murderers to them. Celia turned on the TV and turned up the volume to full blast. Then she and Lazarus went to different upstairs bedrooms to keep watch. Sure enough, Anu and Laimute heard the sound and ran back to the cottage. Lazarus alerted Celia that they were coming from his side and as soon as the Baltic Alliance was close enough, they started hurling shards of glass and sharp kitchen utensils at them. One of the shards, thrown by Lazarus, hit Anu in the eye and got lodged in her brain, resulting in her death. Laimute briefly looked back, then started weaving her path so the two of them would have to keep throwing in different directions. Laimute entered the cottage through one of the shattered windows, but did not anticipate that the floors would be covered in cooking oil. She tried to regain her footing when Celia came sliding across the tile floor as if it were an ice rink. She picked up Laimute's spear, which had rolled away from her, and used it to stab the Lithuanian girl in the back. As she gasped in pain, Celia struck her in the face with the mace multiple times, yelling about how the Baltic Alliance was a bunch of traitors. Lazarus came downstairs to see if the deed had been done, and a voice came through the television speakers to announce that Lazarus and Celia were the final two, and one had to kill the other in order to survive. Lazarus was shocked by the announcement and looked at Celia in melancholy silence, only for Celia to chuck the spear straight at him. He managed to duck by diving through the stairs. Celia ran after him and dodged a wardrobe that he threw down at her. This was another trap they'd previously set up for the Baltic Alliance. Lazarus went into one of the bedrooms and Celia ran towards him, mace in hand. In one swift motion, Lazarus grabbed one of the leftover window shards and hurled it at her. It landed in her neck and she started to scream. As she fell to the ground, Lazarus used a kitchen knife to stab her in the heart multiple times until he was sure that she was dead. When the loudspeaker announced his victory, Lazarus let out a piercing howl and started hitting his head against the concrete wall. Staff members rushed to escort Lazarus out of the arena before he could harm himself even further. In an interview a week later, Lazarus stated that he regretted killing Celia, and if he had been given more time to think about it, he would have let her win. Even though he believed everything happened for a reason, he was struggling with how to move forward with his life. He returned home to his family, and after finishing school, he chose to remain working on the farm. He never left the arena except once a year when he was obligated to be a mentor in future Europa Games. Lazarus' win was, however, a diplomatic victory for Cyprus, and the regional government used it to increase their influence within the European states and pushed the army to invade and annex the de facto Republic of Northern Cyprus, reuniting the island after almost 50 years of division. In the following months, thousands of Turkish Cypriots fled the island from mainland Turkey. The third Europa Games lasted three days and were won by Albin Lindqvist, age 15, from Sweden. It had 29 participants, with Liechtenstein being swapped out for Norway, the last associate member to debut. At the time of his reaping, Albin was homeless and had been for several years. He had not initially been present for the reaping when his name was announced, but when he saw his face in a shop display TV, he turned himself in, figuring anything was better than his current life. Sweden was one of the countries automatically qualified for the final of the third Europa Games, following Lisa's 10th place finish the previous year. This year's tributes stayed in the same accommodation this year, and the 14 automatically qualified tributes sat in the rec room as the 10 semi-final qualifiers entered one by one. Albin had not been paying much attention to the games up to that point and did not have much for reaction, but he was saddened by the Norwegian tribute not making it to the next stage. 
The 24 tributes were assigned to their rooms. Due to the odd number of male and female tributes, Albion had a room to himself, and after lying in a real bed for the first time in years, he fell asleep immediately. The tributes were woken up at 8 o'clock the following morning, and during breakfast, the head of training, Frederic Ardiccioni, informed them of some changes to the game this year. There would be three days of training, rather than one, followed by a live interview. He said it would be very important for tributes to make a good impression, because a new twist had been added to the game, sponsors. Every two hours, the people of the participating countries, including the non-qualifiers, would be able to vote to send a care package to one of the living tributes. The countries would vote in a random order and could not vote for the tribute from their own country. Albin became acquainted with the other Nordic tributes. Nikolai, from Denmark, was also aged 15 and physically fit from participating in competitive sailing. Rita, from Finland, was an 18-year-old goth girl who frequently broke down in tears over the coming events of the games. A new addition to the training centre was a station for setting up traps, inspired by the Home Alone-esque constructions made by Lazarus and Celia the previous year. During the first day of training, the Nordics were approached by the Baltic Alliance, who wanted to join forces with them, admitting that it was a mistake for their predecessors to turn down Celia. The Nordics agreed, with Albin stating in a later interview that he thought the Baltic Alliance was weaker than the one the previous year, but that there was strength in numbers. Another new alliance this year was the Benelux Alliance, after Luxembourg qualified from the semis for the first time. As all three members were girls, they decided to start a revival of the girls' alliance, and got the French and Polish tributes to also join their ranks. After three days of training, the tributes all got dressed up for their interviews. They were interviewed in alphabetical order of country, starting with Austria. The interviews were aired live in front of a full audience, and were hosted by Irish television personality, Graham Norton. His snarky personality helped to put on an entertaining show, but he also had an aura of warmth that made it easy for even the shyest tributes to converse with him. The Czech tribute, Hovel, said he was himself an aspiring stand-up comedian, though Graham and the audience were not amused by his attempts at humour. He then controversially called the Europa Games a symptom of late-stage capitalism, and that the dictators who ran the European states would be overthrown soon. The Greek tribute, Nicoletta, was asked about her two kills in the semi-finals, where she ran up to her victims and scared them before bludgeoning them with a mace. Nicoletta stated that she came from a theatre background, and liked to make a show out of everything she did. The Lithuanian tribute, Domante, spent half her interview talking about the attractions of her home city, Vilnius, and Graham asked if she was being paid by their tourism board. Albin was the last to go on stage, wearing a blue suit with a white shirt and black tie. Graham asked Albin if he had anyone cheering him on, to which Albin replied that he had no family since his mother died of a drug overdose when he was 13. Graham got him to delve deeper into his life, with Albin revealing that he had been homeless most of his life and had stopped attending school out of fear that he would be snatched up by the social services. The audience was sympathetic of Albin's life story, letting out awes at certain moments. Graham concluded the interview by asking Albin if he thought winning the games would improve his life situation, to which Albin shrugged and said it couldn't make it worse. During the final evening, the new Northern Alliance discussed their strategy. Their main concern was whether the visibility in the heart of the arena would be as bad as the trees from the previous year. They agreed to look for each other inside the heart, and to stick together if they found each other. They then considered whether they were a strong enough alliance to take control of the heart, and ultimately decided they would give it a go, and retreat if it became unsustainable. Albin woke up in the middle of the night, and went to get a glass of water from the kitchen. He had an encounter with Kiastis, the first winner of the games. Albin asked if he couldn't sleep, and Kiastis said he shared a room with Lazarus, who frequently shouted things in his slumber. Albin asked him what it was like living with the foster family. Kiastis said that his foster family was nice, but he knew others in foster care who weren't so lucky. He added that moving to a different part of the country was overwhelming, especially being a new student who was openly gay and ate someone on live TV. He said that his life had overall improved since he won the Europa Games, but he knew it wasn't the case for Lazarus, who could not accept that his life would never go back to normal. Kiastis asked Albin how he was feeling about the games. Albin said he and his alliance had a plan, but things could always go wrong, and he knew that too well. Albin yawned and said he was ready to go back to bed, and Kiastis wished him good night and good luck. The next morning, the tributes were transported to the arena and all taken to separate changing rooms. A loudspeaker told them to put on the clothes that were in front of them, then wait for further instructions. The tributes were given white collar shirts and smart black shoes. 
The boys were given green striped ties and grey dress pants, while the girls were given plaid skirts and grey tights. When he saw what he had to wear, Killian, from Ireland, jokingly asked if he was doing his leaving cert early. When all of the tributes were dressed, a staff member put a blindfold on them, but instead of being led to the arena, they were instead loaded back onto the bus. Some of the tributes expressed confusion at this, but were told not to speak again until the games had started. After about 15 minutes, the bus stopped and the tributes were escorted out. They did not know where they were, but they could hear their footsteps echoing as they walked. Each tribute was walked up some steps at their podium, and the loudspeaker reminded them of the rules of the game. Then the countdown came and went, and the air horn sounded. The tributes took off their blindfolds and found they were standing on cafeteria tables which were arranged in a square. Inside the square was an array of weapons and backpacks. Game on. Since there were no obstructions in their way, the Northern Alliance was able to run towards each other and stand within a short distance as they got to work gathering supplies and attacking other tributes. While running towards her allies, Rita had her arm sliced off by Sven from Austria. Some of the other Alliance members noticed, but were too busy fending off other tributes to do anything about it. Rita picked up a sword and stabbed herself in the stomach, becoming the third fatality of the grand final. Nicoletta, from Greece, left the cafeteria space after witnessing her alliance partner get stabbed in the head with a spear, but not before picking up a tie that another male tribute had discarded. A total of seven tributes died in the bloodbath, which was less than previous years. The arena this year was a Catholic international school that was out of session for the summer. Sven ran down one of the corridors with a backpack and a knife when Nicoletta snuck up on him, lassoed the tie she picked up around his neck and choked him to death. She took his weapon and backpack and walked off like nothing had happened. The five members of the Northern Alliance were the only ones remaining in the cafeteria and rejoiced at the amount of weapons and supplies they gathered. This celebration was short-lived, however, because Maxime from Latvia was suddenly hit in the temple with an arrow. It was shot by Carlitos from Spain, who shouted, Udradze Shanos, before taking off. During the games, tributes were only allowed to use a small handful of basic phrases in languages other than English. Carlitos, who was very interested in linguistics, would shout goodbye in his victim's native tongue after killing them. This was the third year in a row that Latvia was the first Baltic country eliminated. Carlitos took off, but the remaining members of the Northern Alliance realised it wasn't safe to remain in the cafeteria and looked to set up base elsewhere. Other tributes had already taken to going inside classrooms. The Girls' Alliance, which had already shrunk from five to two members, chose a classroom on the lower floor and barricaded it with tables and chairs. They kept themselves and their weapons against the wall in the near end, and so other tributes wouldn't be able to see them through the window on the door. The Northern Alliance went to a janitor's closet, figuring it would be a good hiding place because the door didn't have a window on it. Two hours passed, and Romania became the first country to vote in a sponsor gift. They awarded it to Nicoletta. She was patrolling the corridors with only her socks on when a staff member walked past her and dropped a package with the Romanian flag on it. After looking around to make sure nobody else was nearby, Nicoletta picked up the package and went into a nearby classroom. It contained a carton of orange nectar juice and a loaf of Kozenak bread. Nicoletta ate the bread right away, but saved the juice for later. After another two hours, Czechia voted to give their sponsor gift to Roman from Slovakia, who was stationed under a teacher's desk with his alliance partner, Havel. They had left the door unbarricaded in hope of luring in other tributes. A staff member prized the classroom window open and told them they had a special delivery though they chose not to go for the package right away in fear of being caught. Nicoletta was also awarded the third sponsor package by Bulgaria, which contained more weapons, and the fourth package, from Belgium, was awarded to Luxembourg, with food that was shared among the girls' alliance. Still hiding in the janitor's closet, the members of the Northern Alliance had a quiet chat amongst themselves, and Nikolai asked them what their dream was if they escaped the arena. Tiu, from Estonia, said she wanted to go on a road trip across the continent. Albin wanted to fall in love, Nikolai wanted to sail to Greenland, and Domante just wanted to go home to Vilnius. At 9pm, a letter was slid under the door, telling them that Albin had been awarded a package by the people of Denmark, and it was right outside. The Allies thought it was legitimate at first, since it was typed out and had the Europa Games logo, but TU pointed out that the school might have a computer lab, and someone could have printed it out. A staff member on the other side of the door assured them it was real, and to take it before another tribute came by. During the night, Carlitos and Pio, from Italy, left their classroom to go hunting for tributes. They had encountered each other earlier in the day, but decided to call a truce and ally, as it would allow them to sleep in shifts. They went through corridors and into classrooms, and killed the Maltese tribute, who was asleep on a desk and had not even bothered to barricade the door. The two boys noticed a staff member go past them, and decided to follow her. She went down the stairs, dropped a sponsor package in front of the closet, and slid a note under the door. 
He on Carlitos whispered about who might be behind the door and noticed there was a Norwegian flag on the package, meaning it was likely the Nordic Alliance. Carlitos suggested breaking down the door, but Pio pointed out that it would make too much noise and they'd be able to prepare a defence. Just then, Tiu, who was keeping watch, unlocked and opened the door and poked out her head and hand to grab the package. But Carlitos grabbed her and put his hand over her mouth, while Pio grabbed her legs. She tried to scream, but the other Alliance members didn't hear. The two boys took her to a locker area about 10 metres away, and Carlitos said, Huvasti, and used an arrow to stab her. After they were sure she was dead, they went back to the closet, carefully shut the door, and took the sponsor package with them. They both agreed that it was too risky to kill the rest of the Alliance at that time. Early in the morning, the Czech and Slovak Alliance snuck downstairs and hid behind the lunch counter. At around 8, the Croatian tribute came to look for food, but Havel and Roman seized him and wrestled him to the ground. They cut off his limbs, then Roman proceeded to emasculate him, saying he always wanted to know what would happen. About an hour later, Killian from Ireland came down to the lunch counter, but it did not quite go to plan the second time round. Killian used his hatchet to stab Havel multiple times and delivered a fatal wound to his neck. Roman decided to skip the severing of limbs and stabbed Killian in the heart. The Northern Alliance woke up to find that the closet was unlocked, Tiu was gone, and one of their sponsor packages was missing. They decided to go on the offence today, figuring that hiding in the closet meant they could easily be cornered. They went looking for classrooms where the door was barricaded, and found one on the lower floor next to the foyer. It was occupied by the two remaining members of the Girls' Alliance, Roxanne from France and Simona from Luxembourg. Albin, Domante and Nikolai started to bash fire extinguishers against the door to break it down. The two girls remained in their positions at first, but when they realised the Northern Alliance was going to succeed, they ran for the window. Only the top of the window opened, so they had to pull themselves up and slide out. When the Northern Alliance finally broke down the door, the girls were already outside, and Albin suggested smashing the window with a chair to save themselves time. They could still see the girls running when they got outside, and the Northern Alliance managed to catch up to Roxanne and dogpile her. Domante was the last to land on the pile and ended up rolling to the ground. Nikolai shouted at Domante to keep running after the other girl, Simone. Roxanne screamed as Albin sat on top of her and Nikolai pinned down her arms. Albin used his sword to slit Roxanne's throat, then the two of them got up and ran after Domante. They reached a small collection of trees and crept around trying to find Simone. Nikolai accidentally set off a trap which triggered an axe to slice him in half at the torso. As his top half lay panting on the ground, the other two looked down in shock and Albin questioned how Simone managed to set up the trap so quickly when the trap had in fact been set up by Nicoletta the day before. Nikolai started to say a dramatic goodbye to his allies, but they walked off before he could finish. As he slowly ran out of oxygen, Nikolai called them both assholes and hoped that they died next. Meanwhile, Nicoletta began her morning hunt for tributes and spotted Carlitos and Pio in the cafeteria, trying to close in on Roman from either side. Nicoletta hid behind a wall that partitioned the cafeteria tables from the foyer and tried to throw a knife at the back of Pio's head, but it missed and hit the table. This did, however, throw the boys off, and Roman used the opportunity to run at Carlitos with his knife and stab him in the chest. As Carlitos collapsed, Roman said adios and ran off. Pio had already fled in a different direction when Nicoletta entered the cafeteria space, helped herself to Carlitos' supplies, including his bow and arrow, before running after Roman. Albin and Domante continued to search for Simone around the school garden, not realising that Simone had run in the opposite direction and was actually hiding in some bushes near the football field. They decided to go back inside the building to keep looking. Nicoletta went into every classroom in the corridor, trying to find the sap from Slovakia, as she called him. She looked inside cupboards, under tables, and even under loose floorboards. Roman heard her trashing about and tried to do a sneak attack, but when he entered the classroom, Nicoletta happened to be facing his direction. He ran off, but Nicoletta stepped into the corridor and shot an arrow which hit him in the back. He tried to keep running, but soon lost control of his legs. Nicoletta caught up with him and pinned his head to the ground as she brought a throwing knife to his throat. Roman asked why she had gone after him and not Pio, to which Nicoletta laughed and said that Pio ran screaming when her knife hit the table and she could deal with him later. Nicoletta slit Roman's throat, then she ran back down the same corridor and set up camp in one of the classrooms, using a chair to keep the door handle in place. Albin and Domante forgot about trying to catch Simone and reached one of the school's computer labs. They tried to access the internet, but it had been blocked by the Europa Games game makers beforehand, so they settled for taking turns playing an educational CD-ROM while the other person kept watch. The remaining tributes were all too exhausted to hunt for tributes, so much of day two passed without anything happening. During that time, Domante received three sponsor packages, and Nicoletta received two. 
By the evening, Simone was very hungry and finally left her hiding place in the bushes. She walked straight past the school garden, which was full of vegetables she could eat, and entered the school through one of the side doors. The rest of the tributes were hidden away in classrooms, so nobody stopped her from entering the storage room behind the lunch counter and helping herself to the contents inside. The Europa Games staff had stocked the room with fresh produce the day before the game started, but few tributes managed to get out of thanks to the Czech and Slovak alliance killing anyone who tried. Simone had the best meal out of anyone in the game so far. Feeling full, Simone decided to look around for a place to sleep and went to look through classrooms in the top east wing of the school. Holding up her knife in defence, she looked through the glass window on the door of each classroom to see what her options were. She reached the last door at the end of the corridor, which is a computer lab. Her interest peaked. She wondered if the computer still worked. She looked through the window to make sure nobody else and Albion saw her. Simone made a run for it, but Albion and Domante chased after her, both wielding their weapons. Simone had proven herself to be fast before and tried her best to ignore the cramp of her full stomach. She realised Domante was about to catch up, so she suddenly stopped, faced Domante, and stabbed her in the chest multiple times. Albion caught up and tried to get Simone with his sword, but she dodged and ran into a nearby classroom. As Albion tried to charge at her, she threw a table at him, and it hit him in the nose and he began to bleed. Albion continued trying to get at her with his sword, but she kept throwing chairs at him to try and put him off. Simone threw her knife at him, and it hit the side of Albion's stomach. To clarify, the handle of the knife hit the side of his stomach, which bruised him a bit at least. She made one last attempt to run away, but Albion stabbed her straight through the stomach. Albion gazed into the eyes of his Simone kebab, then he pulled the sword back out and she collapsed on the ground. Albion ran back out to find armoured staff members carrying Domante's body away. As he shed tears, he said that she'd made her city and country proud, and he'd say hi to Cassius for her. Albion went back to the computer lab to rest, stopping at the nurse's office along the way to bandage up his nose. Little did he know that Pio had been hiding in the classroom right across the way from the fighting, but decided not to intervene. The loudspeaker announced the names of the 11 tributes who died that day in alphabetical order of country, starting with the Croatian boy and concluding with Carlitos from Spain. Only three were left standing. Pio woke up the next day at around 6 in the morning. He opened the doors of the cupboard he was hiding in and decided to go for a walk outside, so he pushed open the classroom's emergency exit door. But he forgot something important about emergency exits. Nicoletta was admiring the sword that she had been given by the people of Cyprus during the night when she heard a faint alarm from the other side of the school. Albin heard it too, but he was in no mood to be chasing after people, so he grabbed as many weapons as he could and went to set up a bunker somewhere. As Nicoletta ran towards the alarm, she spotted Pio running across the corridor in the floor above and ran to the stairs on the other end. Pio realised she was coming and crossed into another section of the school, which had a stairwell that led to the cafeteria. After running downstairs, Pio dove behind the lunch counter to catch his breath, only to find that he wasn't alone. Albin shot him a smirk and started to play eeny meeny miny mo with the assortment of weapons he'd acquired from sponsor packages and past allies. Nicoletta skidded to a halt upstairs as the intercom announced that she and Albin were the final two, and to report to the foyer for their final battle. As they approached from different ends, the intercom noted that this was the second year in a row that a Nordic country was facing off against a Greek-speaking country for the victory. Nicoletta complimented Albin's sword, and Albin did likewise. They began to sword fight each other and were both pretty evenly matched, doing a good job at calling each other's movements. Nicoletta casually asked Albin about his time in the games, as they had barely interacted until then and only had each other's interviews to go off. Albin responded by asking Nicoletta if she'd ever seen one of those horror movies where everyone dies one by one. Nicoletta said that having such a huge alliance was lame, and she got by on her own for most of the game. She asked Albin how many people he'd killed. Albin replied three then corrected himself and said four, but Nikolai helped one of them. Nicoletta replied that she'd killed five tributes, including the two in the semis. She did not know that Nikolai got sliced by her trap, so she technically killed six. Nicoletta asked Albin what happened to his nose, but as he started to answer, she stabbed him in the lower chest. Albin clenched in pain, but as Nicoletta attempted to stab him a second time, he headbutted her and knocked her to the ground. Nicoletta kept waving her sword about as Albin sat on top of her and bashed her head into the marble tiles until she lost consciousness. Then he prized her sword out of her hand and stabbed her in the heart. The loudspeaker announced that Albin was the winner of the third Europa Games, and some paramedics on standby carried him out in a stretcher. He was rushed to the hospital to get his wounds treated and surgery on his nose. In an interview a couple of weeks later, Albin was presented with footage of Nicoletta's kills throughout the game. He praised her creativity and for getting so far while flying solo. When he returned to Sweden, Albin was fostered by an Ethiopian couple and got a private tutor to catch up on two years of school. In the months following the games, he started talking to Cassius online, and the two soon became good friends. When Albin turned 18, he moved into an apartment in Brussels that was downstairs from Cassius, and Albin later became the godfather of Cassius' adopted son, Eurus.